Are you looking to get into VGC? Are you overwhelmed by the sheer amount of options and information out there? Well, you have come to the right place. Yo, 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 YouTube, what's good? This is Austin or Gliscor TV bringing you guys a brand new video today. Today, I'm going to be giving you a beginner's course, a entry into Pokemon VGC. So a small disclaimer here before we begin. I'm going to be tossing information at you guys, so feel free to go back and watch specific parts of this video. Uh, competitive Pokemon is very in-depth. I could be here all day and night explaining to you guys the intricacies of competitive VGC. But like I said, just feel free to come back and re-watch what you need to watch. Thank you. Now, to start off, we're going to simply dissect what VGC actually is. VGC stands for Video Game Championships, but that's not really the important thing. VGC is official format for competitive Pokemon, and it is played in the 2v2 format. How it works is each player gets to look at each other's teams. See so your opponent's team of six and you have your team of six, and you both choose four Pokemon each that you can use. And then it's played in a best of three. So the first person to win two of the three series wins the entire match. Uh, on top of that, in VGC, there is actually something called an open team sheet. But we're not going to get really into that because it's only really relevant if you're competing and you're practicing to go to these events like I'm kind of showing you here. Why you should play Pokemon VGC? It adds so much more life to Pokemon as a whole, so much more playability. It gives you a reason to flex all those shinies that you guys have been shiny hunting, myself included. It's the reason why I shiny hunt a lot of the Pokemon I do, is to hopefully be able to use them in VGC one day. Now, there's a lot of different things when it comes to playing competitive Pokemon. You have team building, you have EVs and IVs, you have item choices. Um, there's so much significant information, it's very easy to get overwhelmed, especially for new players. So to start off, we're going to start by covering EVs and IVs. Now if you know what these are already, you're you're quite familiar with them, I'd recommend just skipping ahead in the video. Uh, there's no use to like go through the information again. But if you don't, this is a perfect reminder and a refresher on what they are. Uh, so IVs are individual values, that is what they stand for, and they are given to a Pokemon when it is born or it is caught. These stats cannot be changed no matter what. The only way they can actually be changed is or increased is through bottle caps through an NPC in the Pokemon series game. Uh, Pokemon IVs, they range from 0 to 31, 0 being no good and 31 being the best. And they do this for all six stats, for HP, attack, defense, special defense, special attack, and speed. <laughs> now, if you're not aware, there are multiple ways to get higher IVs on your Pokemon. One of them is to breed, specifically with a, like a six IV ditto, for example. Or you can go and catch Pokemon in terror raids. So based on the difficulty of the terror raid, if it's a three star, four star, five star, six star, or even seven star, you can minus one from that. And it means that you will have perfect IVs from said raid. So to give you an example, cause that might be a little confusing is if you were to go and hunt one of those special seven star raids, like the Charizard one that we had recently, that means that that Charizard, if you catch it, it will 100% have six IV, um, guaranteed perfect six IVs and vice versa. So if you go for a six star, you'll have guaranteed five uh, perfect IVs. And if you go for a five star, you'll have guaranteed perfect four IVs. Now, every Pokemon, depending on how it's built, like for example, an Incineroar, an Incineroar is a physical attacking Pokemon most of the time. It uses moves like Darkest Lariat, Flare Blitz, Knock Off, and those are all physical moves. So when you're building an Incineroar, you want it to have five IVs. You want it to be the best in every stat except special attack because special attack will not be used. And you will use this premise for every single Pokemon. You do not want a mixed attacking Pokemon. You want it to specialize in only really one thing, unless it's defending and then you put no kind of offensive investment in it. EVs stand for effort values. Now, I'm sure you guys might know what effort values are, but for every four effort values that you put in any stat, it will give you one total stat point. Every single Pokemon in the entire game, no matter what you knock out, will always give you EVs. Some specialize in HP, some defense, some special defense, some special attacks, some speed. You kind of get the picture. 
Now, if you were to expedite the process on EVing your Pokemon, uh, you want to use either items that are like Power Bracer or stuff like that, or you want to use medicines or vitamins. Like for example, if you were to put a protein on a Pokemon, that will give you 10 attack EVs. An iron will give you 10 defense EVs. A calcium will give you 10 special, special attacking EVs, if that makes sense. Now, each Pokemon, they have a max of 510 EVs that can be given into the entirety of the Pokemon. And on top of that, there is a max of 255 EVs in any given stat. So please keep in mind that 255 EVs cannot be divided by four. So you'll have three left over. And what do I mean by that? I mean that 63 times into 255 would equal 252, which means three EVs would be left over. So that means those three EVs would essentially be wasted because remember, you only get an additional stat for every four EVs. For example, if you were to just simplify it, let's give a really offensive Pokemon. Let's make, let's give Fluttermane as an example because Fluttermane is an extremely popular Pokemon in VGC. If you were to build a competitive Fluttermane, something very standard would be 252 special attack to max it out and 252 special or uh, speed, sorry. And then at that point you have 504 EVs in total. So there would be six left. So you would put four in like HP, maybe defense, maybe even special defense, just to get you that one additional stat point, just to simplify things. Now you can also complicate this. There are Pokemon like Amoongus, for example, where it has no offensive investment. It is usually split between HP, defense, and special defense uh, to maximize its defensive capabilities because it is a more support type Pokemon. And every single Pokemon has a role generally. Sometimes it's support, sometimes it's offensive, sometimes it's a glass cannon, sometimes it's speed control, sometimes it's weather control. There are so many options when it comes to competitive Pokemon. That is why this game is so deep when it comes to the competitive scene. But it also means that you just, you can't really be prepared for everything. And it is extremely easy to overwhelm yourself when it comes to this, these kind of things. I'm gonna get in, into more detail on the team building aspect later on in the video. Another thing that I wanted to quickly mention is natures. Now, natures are pretty simple, honestly. Every single nature will have a, a positive and a negative on that nature. What do I mean by that? When you're, I will show on the screen here, when you're looking at a Pokemon, it'll have a stat that is highlighted red and it'll have a, ha a stat that is highlighted blue. And what this means is that the red will have a 10% increase in that stat and the blue will have a 10% decrease. So for example, an adamant nature in Pokemon means the attack will gain plus 10% and the special attack will lose 10% of its total stat. Now, there are also some other kinds of natures, for example, like hardy nature, neutral to everything. What do I mean by that? There are like four or five natures in total. We got hardy, docile, serious, and bashful, and quirky. And those natures, they don't give any positives and they don't give any negatives. So it's just a completely neutral nature. Now, in competitive Pokemon, these natures are rarely, if ever, used because you definitely want your Pokemon to specialize or have an increase in a stat because a lot of the time, again, special or physical attackers, so there's always going to be something that you can decrease a stat in. You know, isn't this game supposed to be a children's game? How is the game so complicated with all these dang numbers? I've probably said a lot of information that you guys might know, but it's also complicated at the same time. Okay, so moving along here, instead of overcomplicating certain things, I'm gonna show you guys a couple resources that are really good for competitive Pokemon so that you guys can kind of see what I'm talking about when it comes to these numbers and stuff like that. So we have this website here, it's called Peakalytics. This is a great resource for competitive Pokemon, especially for new players. So what's going to happen here is we're currently in 2024 VGC Reg F. We're just going to click on this here. And what this is on the left hand side here on your screen, this means these percentages mean percentage of these Pokemon being on a team. So 57 or 58% of the time Fluttermane is on a team. So more likely than not, you will see Fluttermane. Same thing when it comes to Incineroar, which is almost, which is almost 50%. One out of every two teams is almost guaranteed to have an Incineroar into VGC when you're playing online. Same thing with Urshifu, Raging Bolt, Tornadus, Ogre, Ogre Pond, etc, etc. Now, what the important thing is, we're just going to click on Fluttermane here for an example. So you can see its base stats here, which isn't the biggest thing, but this is just good to keep in mind for speed tiers. The speed tier of Fluttermane is 135 if it's max 
with its uh, timid nature. It could go even higher than this if you give it a booster energy and it uh, increases its speed. So now right here as well, you can see Fluttermane's most common move sets. How often these sets of Fluttermane, what moves they have. 92% of the time it has Moonblast. 71% of the time it has Shadow Ball. 70% of the time it has Dazzling Gleam. 50% of the time it has Protect. Icy Wind, Parasong, Taunt, Trick Room, Power. Like you understand there's so many options when it comes to these Pokemon. And you can just pick a standard set. Moving on, it shows your abilities. It shows the most common items. And you see the most common item here is a booster energy. So keep that in mind. We got choice specs. We got sash. We got a fairy feather. We have other, which is random stuff, which isn't enough to show. It also shows the most common teammates here. And you can see the most common teammate with Fluttermate is Incineroar. Especially because you can see the representation of Incineroar. We got Raging Bolt, Urshifu. So, for example, if you wanted to build a team around Fluttermane, looking at some of these most common teammates are a really good start. And if you don't know what you're doing, this is a great way to start. Moving on down here, we have the EV spreads. Now, this is the most important aspect, in my opinion. But because Fluttermane is so popular, you can see here the top EV set. The top EV set is only 6% likely so like remember the example i gave before of the 252 252 like look at that set look there it is right there the timid 252 252 is only used on three percent of flutter mains now instead of overwhelming you guys when it comes to team composition and things like that i'm going to show you basics of how to roughly put together a team but i also want to tell you about uh team codes so all the time, there are specifically rental codes online that you can use to practice and try out a team. And that that is, in my opinion, the best way to start getting into it because then you can just start battling and you don't have to worry about your team composition. Okay, so this is the second resource I wanted to show you guys. You guys might not might know what this is, but this is Pokemon Showdown. Now, Pokemon Showdown is really useful in a myriad of different ways and facets. The best thing about this is the team builder application and the fact that you can actually practice. But for now, we're just going to be focusing on the team builder side. So I've showed you here, we have a flutter main. I put a choice specs on the flutter. It has its regular ability. I put the moves because it's only going to be used in choice specs. So it doesn't have, this is built for VGC as well for regulation F. And you can see here, guest spread. You can even just choose this if you want and it'll make the set for you. But what's really good about this is instead of having to go in Scarlet and Violet uh, to go find this Pokemon, build this Pokemon, IV train, EV train, give it the item, give it the moves, it just saves you an exuberant amount of time. It's a big deal. It really is. Now, you can build a team right here on Showdown. You can go practice in the VGC Regulation F 2024 ladder. And you can get some experience, see if the team is right for you, and then you can decide to actually build it in SV, which is a much better solution than doing it all yourself, wasting a bunch of time, wanting to edit your team, etc., etc. For new players, this is really useful instead of overwhelming yourself. I still think it's personally, preferably better to go do some rental code teams. You don't have to worry about the team building aspect. You could just worry about battling, especially with proven teams. But this is a good option if you want to build a team around a pokemon that's not really used like for me for example i got a shiny latios recently that i want to build a vgc team around okay so i want to cover some basic fundamentals when it comes to vgc team building the first thing that i want you guys to be able to do especially for beginners is to understand your type matchups your type matchups are going to be imperative for competitive battling they're one of the most important things when it comes to in-game knowledge. So if I were you, I would look up an online type sheet and kind of study it, especially if you're uneasy of what is super effective or what is neutral or what is not very effective or what doesn't affect very many types. Even me, as a 25-year-old veteran Pokemon player, I still make mistakes occasionally. I'm like, is, does that... Is that super effective? Is that neutral? I still, you know what I mean? I still forget. It happens. It happens to the best of us, for sure. Typing is very, very, very important. That should be number one. Another thing to keep in mind when it comes to typing is try not to overlap your types. What I mean by that is you don't really want two psychic types unless you're going with like a psychic terrain and a expanding force spamming type. You don't really, really want overlapping types that much, if you can help it anyway. Number two, you want to have some semblance of speed control. 
Now, this could be a fast Tailwind setter, a prankster Tailwind setter. You could have a trick room mode. You could have an imprisoned trick room mode so that you stop the uh, the opponent from using trick room. There's so many options when it comes to two speed control. You could use Icy Wind, you could use Bulldoze. You just wanna make sure that you have some way to make sure that you're the one going first. You can use priority moves and not even worry about speed as long as your opponent doesn't have psychic terrain. There's a lot of things to keep in mind when it comes to speed control, but you need to have some semblance of speed control on your team. You wanna have a taunt user or a Pokemon that could stop your opponent from using like setup moves or like annoying non-attacking moves against you. Even stopping their protect pivotal sometimes. There's a lot of non-damaging moves in VGC that are very, very relevant, very prominent. VGC is not like what it was when we used to play the games. I remember when I was younger, I used to only put attacking moves on my Pokemon. I'm like, yo, this move is dumb. For singles, it's a lot less relevant. You know, sometimes you can get like a dragon dance or a setup or a swords dance or something like that set up in singles. But in doubles, moves like Trick Room, Protect, Taunt, all of these kinds of, they're, they're essentially like power moves, but they're just non-damaging moves. But they stop your opponent from doing what they want to do. Which again, like is the name of the game. You want to be able to knock out your opponents before they knock out yours in any way, shape, or form. Another thing, you want to make sure that your stats are all good. Like I was talking about earlier. You want to make sure your IVs, EVs, items, and natures are all good, all ready to go. You don't want to be having to adjust anything before the tournament starts. Another thing to keep in mind is terrain pressure. So the most prominent Pokemon that have terrain, especially as their ability, are Indeedee and Rillaboom. You, I exp you expect to see those Pokemon almost everywhere, so have some kind of counter to it or make sure you don't just auto lose to like an expanding force or you know a grassy glide from Rillaboom. Be prepared for these type of things is very imperative as well. Next is weather control. So whether it's like prankster weather, for example, like using rain dance or sunny day on like a Landorus or having Torkoal with drought or any of these different myriad of options to counter your opponent from using their weather is also extremely important. Okay guys, so this is roughly how you kind of team build around one Pokemon. So remember before I was telling you guys about Latios? Well, here's my Latios set. It's got Soul Dew, it's got Tailwind for speed control, Draco Meteor, Luster Purge Protect, and uh, Soul Dew so it can do so much damage. It's max speed with uh, Timid Nature. And I kind of built my team around this Latios. There isn't too many multiple weaknesses on this team. It kind of all... Um, and this is just this is just like a rough draft. I could make this even better and I still there's still some stuff that I cannot like I can't really counteract weather and I can't really counteract terrain very well. I kind of have to play around what my opponent's trying to do, which isn't the best. I'm not gonna lie. That's why this team could definitely use some work, but I'm just gonna show you kind of how it all works. So Latios here, he has he has quite a few weaknesses. He has dragon, he has ice. He has Dark, he has Bug, Fairy, and he has Fairy as well, okay? So I chose Incineroar because Incineroar resists Dark and it resists Ice. So that's already two of the weaknesses. We have Fluttermane that resists Dragon and it doesn't isn't super effective against Dark, so that's already good. We have Wellspring Spring Ogre, Ogre Pond, which is also a big help. It's also weak to Bug, the Ogre Pond, which isn't the best. But we do have another resist being Scizor into Bug, and Bug isn't the most popular type in the world, so I don't have to worry too much about that. Um, moving on, I chose Ursaluna because Ursaluna is a really good Pokemon in Trick Room. It doesn't really have the most uh, type differentiation. It's also weak to fighting, just like Incineroar. But we have our Flutter main on our team with as the Ghost type, so we can switch in if we ever need to take a big fighting type attack from like an Urshifu or something like that. Um, and I chose Scizor because Scizor to deal with problematic Flutter mains that might give Latios a hard time because most Flutter mains are going to outspeed Latios. But a single bullet punch, as long as that Flutter doesn't have a Focus Sash, it's going to knock it out more often than not. Especially with the Choice Band, it'll always knock it out. So uh, I only, I really chose Scizor as my like Flutter main kind of counter. Um, we also see Incineroar is weak to ground with Ogre Pond being a resist and ground not even affecting Latios. So you kind of see you can kind of see how it all kind of fits together. Even with Scizor, Scizor's biggest weakness is four times weak to fire. 
but we have a resist when Ogre Pond uh, terrestrializes into pure water type, and then we also have Incin and Latio, so we have quite a few fire resists. We have a couple ground resists. As for water resists from the Incin and the Ursulina, we have Ogre Pond, who two times resists it in neutral state, and then it one times resists it when it terrestrializes. And yeah, so it's just roughly for the typings and speed control, we're, we're doing okay. But the problem is if our opponent like, you know, starts out with like pure trick room or something like that, they're going to overwhelm us very quickly. So this team would definitely need some practice and some fine tuning. But this is just what I came up with just off the, the tip of the dome. So another thing to keep in mind when you're playing competitive Pokemon is there's a lot of RNG involved. And what do I mean by that? Well, in competitive Pokemon, there's stuff like Thunder Wave, so you can get paralyzed 25% of the time. There's stuff like Rock Slide, where you can get flinched. There is, you can get crit. There are things that you that are out of your control when it comes to battling. And like, in a competitive setting, you definitely want to remove as much RNG as you possibly can. But I'm going to tell you, there's no way to completely remove it. So rather than becoming defeated and thinking stuff like wow if i didn't get crit there i would have won say things like if i would have played better in the in the other turns i might have been able to overturn that crit in my favor so that i could have won this game despite getting crit despite getting hacks despite getting paralyzed um and it's just a much better way to think about it so what i mean by this as well is just to try and learn from your mistakes rather than just blaming other circumstances that you can't control uh, there's RNG, it's going to happen to everyone. You might miss a 90% accurate move. There's just tons of different things that can happen. It's just, you can't be prepared for them all. So just take it in stride, learn. At the end of the day, just try and have fun playing Pokemon. That's all this is. Maybe you can turn this into something later on when you get much better at it, much more efficient. But for now, just try and have fun. Even if you lose, it's okay. So the last thing I wanted to mention, guys, is make sure that you practice. Practice makes perfect. If you guys want the best opportunities to get better in a competitive Pokemon setting, I would recommend going to play the ranked online ladder in Scarlet and Violet. You can also practice online on Pokemon Showdown, like I said earlier, if you guys wanted to try out some teams. But I would recommend trying out the online ranked ladder for sure. The only problem with ranked, as I will mention, is it's best of one closed team sheet. So there are some janky stuff that you might not be prepared for. You know, like Steel Terra Dondozo when you're trying to get rid of its stat boost with like Clear Smog, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, don't get discouraged when it comes to the online ladder. You know, keep pushing through, keep persevering, and learn, learn, learn. That's all I'm going to say. You know, even if my guide isn't the best, uh, I'd, I'd recommend looking up more guides online, doing some more research, and, uh, and figuring out just what works for you. So with that, I want to thank you guys all for watching. Uh, if you guys have any feedback or concerns, leave them down below in the comments. Love to, I'd love to help if I can. But yeah, thank you very much, YouTube. This has been Austin or Glasscore TV, and we'll see you later.